Archbishop Reno Fisichella, thank you so much for receiving us here in the offices of the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. Thank you for coming. We know each other well. We work together on the World Youth Day in, in Rome and also the World Youth Day in Toronto. And now our positions have changed. I'm the head of Salt and Light Television. You are the president of this newest of the dicasteries in Rome at the Vatican for the new evangelization. But before we talk about that, tell our audience in Canada and our many viewers around the world, who is Rino Fisichella? Who am I? The big question. Well, I can tell you, uh, priest of the Diocese of Rome, I taught for 20 years at Gregorian University Fundamental Theology. And then uh, the Holy Father, John Paul II, appointed me auxiliary bishop for his diocese, the Diocese of Rome. I did for 10 years, and during this period, in 2002, I was appointed uh, president, director of the Lateran University, that means the University of the Holy Father, the university in, in, uh, within the Vatican, and then also president uh, for the Academy uh, for Life. And uh, in June uh, 2010, uh, Pope Benedict XVI appointed me as a first president of this uh, new dicastery for the new evangelization. It's interesting, Archbishop, that the Holy Father chose for this key position a professor of fundamental theology. He didn't choose a canon lawyer, a church historian, a professor of liturgy, but a fundamental theology. Why do you think, uh, what's involved in all of that? How, why did the Holy Father choose you with your background for this position? Well. I don't know the real reason why he, he chose me, but I can tell you that in the private uh, audience that I had with him, uh, he said also this, uh, this uh, sentence, uh, very meaningful for me, because uh, he told me, I have the intention to, uh, to found a new dicastery on new evangelization. And he told me immediately, what do you think? And I said, well, Holy Father, is a challenge. And so, continue speaking, he told me, yes, but uh, you taught for many years fundamental theology. You will be able to do it. But we need also to explain what fundamental theology is, because uh, uh, fundamental theology is, uh, is the capacity to understand the revelation of God for people today is the capacity to explain that Jesus doesn't belong uh, uh, to the past uh, as uh, an archaeological things, but Jesus is, uh, is for today, is for people today, is a contemporary of us, is to show that there is no contraposition between a faith and reason. So all of this and all the many other questions uh, can, uh, can be very helpful in, uh, in working for this uh, new evangelization because uh, it means for us uh, to understand the culture of today, people today, and to show that uh, the revelation of God and the love of God is necessary. The word, the new evangelization, is one of those catchwords, a key word. It's being used all over the place right now. It's certainly appearing in many of Benedict XVI's talks, his audience addresses, his talks to bishops during the ad limina. The word is out there, and yet the question remains, what is it? And what I'd like to do with, it, with you, you're the, the one sitting in this hot seat, in this critical position in Rome, explain to our viewers what is the first evangelization and what is the new evangelization, and why do we need both in our day and age? What's the first evangelization? Well, you know, Jesus Christ uh, uh, did the church in order to continue his message, his teaching. And the mission of the church is to announce uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have uh, two different ways. In one hand, uh, there is people that uh, they don't know, they never heard uh, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the first evangelization. As we call with a technical word, uh, is the evangelization at the gentes. That means the mission, 
to go in every part of the world where there is uh, uh, people, uh, youth, uh, men, women, they never heard uh, the name of Jesus Christ. But there is, on the other hand, there is uh, the church living in, uh, in uh, all the world, in all countries of the world. And essentially there is the, the church of ancient tradition. I think, for instance, uh, Europe, Canada, United States, Australia, Philippines, Latin America, Brazil, there is uh, the church uh, from century and century in these countries, and our communities are no more able to be, in the right sense, uh, believers, uh, Christians, Catholics. For this reason, we need a new evangelization, because with the new evangelization, we would like to, to make stronger the identity of our believers and to uh, make uh, uh, more aware of the necessity of belonging to the community, to the church. It's, it's very well put. It's that, that newness, a fresh approach to things. I can think of Pope John Paul II in Novo Millennio in Eunte, that magnificent document at the end of the Jubilee year. Now is the time to set out into the deep, this duc in altum, and you're building on that. There are some in the church, priests, pastoral ministers, catechists, who say, oh no, it's another program. It's something else. How long will this last? It's going to involve all kinds of work. But if I listen to you carefully and I read what you've been saying, I read the Instrumentum Laboris for the Synod, it's not a lot more work. It's rather looking at what we're doing and seeing how we're doing it and how we can do it in a new way. Is that the right You're way right. to look at it? You're right. You're right. And uh, thank you for this uh, question, for this observation, consideration, because I know uh, this is true. There is uh, several, several priests uh, and, uh, and bishops also. And they said, oh, no, now <laughs> a new evangelization. But what did we do before? Was it it was an yeah. evangelization. Right. And this is true, because this is the mission of the church. But we need also to say that society is changed. In this uh, last uh, 30 years, for instance, we have a big change, cultural change, social change. Uh, people are no more the same. Society are no more the same. Of course, if uh, we speak about uh, globalization, we can see that in one part of the world and in another part of the world, the messages that arrive so are the same. In some way, there is no more difference between New York and New Delhi. Uh, but society is different. Man is different. So how can we preach? How can we announce? How, we, how can we have the same, the same thing today if society is no more the same. It can be the illusion to continue to do the same things that we did for centuries and people don't understand us anymore mm -hmm. because language is changed and because uh, the sensibility also is, uh, is different. So new evangelization is not a new work, is a new mentality, is a new language, is a new enthusiasm for uh, announcing the gospel. The decree of establishing this dicastery, the documents surrounding it, much of the thinking that went into this was reflecting a situation in Europe, a pastoral situation in Europe, the Vecchio Continente, the old continent, where the faith was certainly here and the faith has waned now and there are difficulties and problems with the expression of faith. But on another level, would you say that the new evangelization also applies to the newer churches, the church in Africa, the emerging church, the churches in Latin America, the church in the United States, the church in Canada? Is the new evangelization a European phenomenon? No, the new evangelization doesn't touch just Europe. Uh, and uh, also in, in his apostolic letter, Ubicunque Semper, the Holy Father doesn't, doesn't uh, 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 give a description of uh, the territory in which uh, uh, 
uh, we need a new evangelization. He said, uh, in a simple way, especially, especially where there is uh, the secularization, especially in the churches in uh, ancient uh, territories and the Catholic territories and tradition, Catholic tradition. So we don't have just a, a geographic uh, uh, space, uh, Europe, in order to uh, realize the new evangelization. Uh, I can tell you that uh, speaking with uh, several bishops from uh, India and from Africa, well, from India, they bishops coming from Kerala, for instance, they, they said several times, they said, we need also to do new evangelization. Mm -hmm. Well, the first moment I was a, a little skeptical because I said, well, you are in, in, the, in, in the first evangelization. Yeah. But then, then thinking about, I said, well, Kerala. Kerala is a very old tradition because uh, according to the, tra the, 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 the tradition, there is St. Thomas going to evangelize the, 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 yeah. the, so how can we say it's not an old tradition but i can tell you also several bishops from africa they said well we are already in the third generation mm -hmm. it is true we are new churches but the people reaching the third generation they need in this moment a new evangelization so uh, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, to continue with these uh, two positions, evangelization to people who never, never known Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and uh, people who think uh, to know him, uh, but they are indifferent, agnostic, far away from community. So for these uh, Christians, uh, essentially, is the new evangelization. What do you say to the many people today who, who publicly state that I'm religious, I'm spiritual, I love Jesus, but I don't need the church? What's the relationship between Jesus and the church for you? Well, I will say that, uh, first of all, I'm very sad when I heard uh, such expression because uh, it means also that uh, we church, uh, we community, we didn't give uh, a transparent uh, capacity to understand and to perceive our life as a transmission of the gospel. Probably our behavior is no more credible uh, among our, our contemporary people in order to understand uh, the necessity of the church. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I will say, which Jesus Christ do you know really in concrete? Because you cannot know really in concrete the real face of Jesus Christ if it's not in relation with the church. You know, uh, Jesus Christ is announced by the church. The gospel is written by a community, by the church. Mm -hmm. So you cannot understand Jesus Christ in the right way without the church, without a community, because this community, of course, we are with our contradictions. We must confess it. We are sinners. But this is not enough to say that, because there is in the community, in the church, there is the presence of the Spirit. There is, there is good people and there is also sinners people, but there is also signs, concrete signs of sanctity, of holiness in, uh, in, in the community. We cannot just uh, look at, at bad uh, in, in a community. We should also be able to have uh, eyes in order to, to, to see in deep uh, the great things that uh, the church is doing uh, for, uh, for people, for, for uh, uh, poor people, for people in, in needs, for uh, sick people. So uh, in Canada, I mean, uh, how can you forget uh, the, the, the presence of Jean Venier, for example? So I, I think he's, he's a witness uh, given not just in the church in Canada, but uh, to, to, to all the church. Well, it's a very powerful witness. You know, you're in a, a good vantage point to look out over the world. And you see probably more than anybody else the places 
where there are expressions of the new evangelization that are concrete, that are clear, inviting, and beautiful. What would be some of those places in your mind where you see the new evangelization at work? Well, you know, uh, it is true uh, we can have a, a very global and uh, overview in, uh, around all the world and the church in the world. But we cannot think that uh, you do the new evangelization in the same way in Europe, like in Canada, or like in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Because uh, challenges are different. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, we need to understand that uh, the way to do new evangelization in this country, for instance, should be really different. But an example, in the United States, there is a, a group uh, called the FOCUS. FOCUS is a movement uh, uh, born in the States, uh, young family, mm -hmm. they were engaged in the university, and now you have youth people doing new evangelization to youth people in the campus. So in 15 years, you have already the presence of this association in 53 campus in the States. Yeah. I can tell you, for instance, uh, presence in, in France, uh, in, uh, in Britain, starting also in Latin America and in, uh, in the States, probably also in, in Canada. But there is a so-called Alpha Course. Alpha Course is a new way of announcing the gospel. But uh, I know, for instance, that there is uh, in some diocese in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and the very important is uh, uh, so-called uh, Escuela Santa Andresa, the school of St. Andrew. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very important. So coming from Latin America mm -hmm. and uh, moving in, uh, in, in Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, this is new evangelization in order, uh, in order to give a coherent formation for catechists and for leaders in the community. I'm glad you mentioned FOCUS because in Canada we have a similar organization, and I, I know you've met them, Catholic Christian Outreach, known as CCO. Right. And these are very powerful witnesses on university campuses across our country, just as FOCUS, and the, the founder, Curtis, has, has done a wonderful right. job in proclaiming the gospel, oftentimes on secular campuses and hostile environments. You spoke a key word, you mentioned a key word, formation. We speak about the necessity of a solid formation. How is one formed to do the work of the new evangelization? What would be the critical elements necessary for the formation of, of new evangelizers? Well, you know, uh, we must be very sincere, very concrete. Realism should be a key word for new evangelization. Realism. Realism. You're yeah. right. Because uh, you know, we know that there is a big ignorance uh, among our believers about uh, the basic content of faith. There is no more a coherent knowledge of faith. And this is, uh, is very bad because this is uh, a, a, a condition in order, in order, this is a limit in order to understand your identity, your personal identity. For this reason, uh, formation is important for us. I think, uh, for instance, about the necessity to know the Word of God, first of all, and also to approach the catechism of the Catholic Church. In uh, this year, we have uh, two main uh, anniversaries. The first one, 50 years of the beginning of the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm the most important event in the history of the church for the 20th century. Mm -hmm. What happened with the Vatican II, for instance? The teaching of the Vatican II is really known by our communities. I mean, is the teaching of the Vatican II is the reality, the life in order to announce the gospel today, or is a teaching related to uh, some uh, expert, uh, probably few priests uh, studying the documents, but the spirit of the council, 
what the Council for the Church uh, did is still present in our communities. How would you respond to the criticism or the, uh, perhaps the idea that's out there that there's an attempt to do away with Vatican II, to erase the memory of Vatican II, to say that Vatican II caused so many problems that it's now important to leave it behind and go forward. Is the message of the Second Vatican Council still valid today? Well, it's still valid because it is the teaching of the Church. This is a very extraordinary moment for the Church and the teaching, the magisterium, the extraordinary magisterium of the Church belongs to our history, so cannot be limited to a, a part of, of the time and our history, absolutely. But I would like to say something more. We cannot make a confusion between the teaching of the Vatican II and the misunderstanding of the teaching, of this teaching, because uh, well, we can have uh, several examples, and uh, so uh, my teaching in the university helped me also to understand that. But one thing is the teaching, and the other is a personal interpretation of this teaching that is something very different. One last question for you. We're on the eve of the Synod on the New Evangelization. Not only are you here to create and, and bring about a new dicastery, but you're going to play a very important part in the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization, which is set for October 2013, in a few months. What are your hopes for this Synod? What do you hope the Synod will produce, cause, generate, inspire? Well, first of all, it will be a very important moment uh, for us because uh, we will have uh, a dialogue with uh, all the bishops coming from uh, around all the world, representative bishop, because the synod is uh, the presence of representative bishop coming from all the church, the Catholic church. I think that this will be a very important moment because, first of all, they will bring the experience already present uh, as a new evangelization in the church. And then uh, it will be also a challenge for us to understand what uh, we can do in common in the complementary situation, because uh, as we said, uh, we cannot do the same things in this country and in another. But uh, sure, we need a global project. We need uh, a common foundation for a new evangelization. And for me, this is very important uh, to understand uh, how the bishops coming for the Synod, they will uh, suggest to the Holy Father uh, in order to create uh, the apostolic exhortation after the Synod, because uh, probably the most important thing uh, would be the apostolic letter of the Holy Father in conclusion of the Synod, in order to understand what will be uh, the, the, the direction that the Church should take for the new evangelization in the future. But I can assure you that uh, it will be a very important moment, and uh, as the Holy Father said, uh, uh, just before Christmas, the future of the Church in the next uh, years will be the new evangelization. Archbishop Fisichella, what a great pleasure to hear someone articulate so clearly the basic principles of this, this dicastery and also your own passion, your own understanding, your own hopes for what this dicastery can become and what the Synod could be. I want to pledge you the complete support of Salt and Light Television. Through, by speaking to me, you're speaking to hundreds of thousands of people across Canada, the United States, and many parts of the English-speaking world, and know that we are at your service to help you in this wonderful work that's been entrusted to you by Benedict XVI. Thank you very much. Thank you. On disait qu'elle pourrait nous relier tous, jusqu'à ce que nous fassions partie d'un même ensemble. Un réseau global de personnes qui, en un instant, peuvent être en lien les unes avec les autres. Mais jusqu'à quel point sommes-nous réellement branchés à nous-mêmes et au choix de vie auquel nous aspirons vraiment?
En 2003, de jeunes professionnels ont commencé un nouvel apostolat afin de poser des questions sérieuses et chercher des réponses à la fois justes et vraies. Qui sommes-nous? Quelle est notre foi? Quelle est notre espérance? Et c'est ainsi qu'est née Celle et Lumière. Jusqu'à quel point ça a évolué, le web religieux? Comment savoir vraiment si on a la foi ou pas? Vous étiez un qui n'avait jamais eu peur de parler aux médias. Ainsi, nous serons auprès des malades, sel et lumière. Lorsqu'il est mort, c'était certain que c'était un saint. C'est vraiment un don de l'esprit, la prière, la contemplation. Vous nous avez fait part de ce que vous pensiez de notre travail. Vous nous avez demandé de continuer. Et nous le faisons avec vous et pour vous. Car lorsque vous trouvez quelque chose qui rend la vie beaucoup plus belle, vous vous devez de le partager. Pour que nous puissions tous en profiter, et faire l'expérience ensemble de quelque chose de plus grand que nous-mêmes. Et devenir une lumière pour les autres, une lumière pour le monde.